as I went through my first lesson, communicating without words, I took down a series of notes so that I could share the key points of the lesson with you in a video. In this video, I'm just going to run through those key points and the most fascinating pieces of learning that I had. There will be some open-ended questions for you to ponder, some discussion points, feel free to leave your thoughts in the comments box below. And again, just to give you a taster of what this foundation training is all about. To recap quickly on my last video, the transitional object is the thing that replaces the breast. The baby begins by sucking its fingers to recreate a sensation of comfort that it gets from being fed and then eventually moves on to an object. The question we were asked was, is that object used by the parent to help that transition take place almost for selfish reasons to kind of free themselves up or is that object sought out by the child in order to naturally make progress with their own life. I think it was clear that throughout the lesson I was questioning my own beginning and how each of the topics in the class and the content from the reading related to my own experience and that was a question that kind of sat with me through the entire day like which of these points and features connect with me and my life and I wonder what my beginning was like and what's buried away in my unconscious that I don't really know about big deep stuff <laughs> we looked at the concept of generational themes so following on from the ghosts in the nursery reading looking at the fact that if a theme is unresolved with the use of therapy then it will potentially continue to replay from one generation to another and that was interesting because it makes you wonder how long your themes have been kicking around and your parents and your grandparents and their parents how many of them were all affected by similar stuff so that was another point for reflection Another question put to us was, what can I hold and contain and what can I not bear? Predominantly because if you can't bear something, you're not going to be able to deal with it very well if it comes into your room from a patient or a client. So really getting you to identify early on what you need to work through and what you need to work on in order to be well placed for the work. I'm just going to read from a sheet of paper whilst I talk about my transitional object, um, Desi my little yellow, I think it was a duck, it did not resemble a duck by the time I'd finished with it, however, here are my thoughts, I loved it to death, I wore it out, I exhausted it, I carried on taking from it even when it was falling apart, they are the physical, factual statements I can make about my transitional object, but the point of this exercise was to think through when you kind of have that beginning relationship with someone, what are your patterns and what are your beginnings like? And if it's if there's any overhang from your transitional object and that, that first sense of learning about how to move from one thing to another, how to start to develop, look back at your pattern and uh, see if there are any areas that you need to work on. Um, I guess, personally speaking, I take a lot from things that I care about, so, and that's a pattern I can identify with as an adult, so Yep, something I'm more than happy to work through in my psychoanalysis. I think it's important when, as a student, you're looking at a case study to remember to not fill in too many of the blanks and create pieces of story that don't actually exist. Having done years of study in this topic and arena already, I'm kind of well trained in that. I therefore, I don't put too much of my own stamp on stuff. I basically work with what I've got. Whereas um, 
working with a lot of people in this field that are clearly new to it and haven't worked with clients before it's amazing how in the discussion groups they're all sort of sitting there going ah oh, but this could mean this and this could mean this and this could mean this and I was just hanging back thinking yeah but where's that coming from is, is that coming from your imagination and your chain of events and your perspective of the world and that is a huge part of training to be a therapist not putting your stuff onto your client and keeping that very separate really really interesting to be in a room of people that haven't yet developed that skill uh, time time will obviously make that I was gonna say time will time will make that happen however I don't know if in psychoanalysis putting your own stuff in the room is a big part of that and because you're analyzing and so you're running it through your filter I'll uh, I'll see how I how this unfolds it did hit me that there was no sort of like conversation around boundaries um, group contract um, client contract stuff like that now when I was doing my counseling training oh my lord did they they thrashed contract to death like we were so aware of our boundaries by the time we finished our training it was unbelievable and then to go into this and there be no discussion on that whatsoever was really strange. I kind of think they're a little bit looser, they're a bit more experiential, whereas counselling perhaps is more governed and there's a bit more tape around it and it's a little bit more formalised in regards to the protocol. So that did feel like it was missing. Just going to read for this next piece. Is the therapist striving to meet the client's anxiety by managing the introduction and the start of the session accordingly? So that is really sort of saying, like if you're going in there with like a really strong sense of how to get this right for your client, then are you not just massaging the anxiety is part of the work for them to feel anxious. I need to come back and revisit that because I have very strong feelings on it being okay for someone, it being safe for someone and I think so far what I've experienced in psychoanalysis is that you can't, they don't, they don't buy into the fact that you can make things safe for other people and that you can um, or you should, but kind of create something in a certain way to help a person. More that the experience and the discomfort is almost more important and then like it's learning to sit with that and so forth. So, yeah, so that was, that was, yeah, that's muddy. I need to, I need to come back and review that. We did a big long case study about survivors of institutional abuse. That was very interesting. A uh, lady that ran that part of the class had personal experience of working with those clients um, over a great number of years. Again, it was a lot more kind of um, case study stuff. Um, she gave, she used a particular client, she anonymously gave pieces of information about that client and got us to discuss it. Of course, there's all our own agendas being thrown into the room and me hanging back thinking, well, devil's advocate, you know. Um, so I do, I do think my other training is paying off, but I do think it's hindering me a little bit because I'm not able to just, not able to just sort of like relax into it because I almost feel like there's some stuff I know that, I know it because I've done the training and the others don't know it because they haven't and yeah, it does make me feel a little bit uncomfortable at times. Enactments, that was a new term that I hadn't, um, hadn't come across before. Basically to um, play out something, so this is working with the implicit, seeing what is unfolding unconsciously, thus bringing the unconscious into the here and now. 
I think it's a theme I had been aware of, but I didn't know the term for it, and I hadn't ever looked at it in that much detail. So it was really, really interesting to see examples, again, case study type examples, of how this can, how this can come to life. I did find myself at the end of that session thinking, well, where do you draw the line? Because like, she did give the example that if you had a client fall in love with their therapist, that for the therapist to engage in that would be fundamentally wrong and you couldn't pass that off as an enactment. And I thought, well, isn't that very convenient that you can do it with some things and you don't necessarily do it with all things? I thought, whoa, okay, this, this is either a thing or it's not a thing. So if you, if you have a scenario where a therapist bends the rules in the name of enactment, how can you then say, but actually these five things here are non-negotiable. If they happen, that's tough. I kind of felt like it let the people off the hook that had got caught up in enactment because it felt like they had neglected their boundaries in the name of enactment and I thought <laughs> yeah I'm not sure I buy that like the rules are the rules like you behave as a therapist professionally and you you do your job properly and those people must be kept safe when they're working with you it's not excusable, in my opinion, to say, well, because of transference, they got sucked into something, or because of enactment, they got sucked into something. I was sitting there very sceptical at that point, because I thought it's either, it's either across the board, and if things like that happen, it's always down to enactment or transference, or you can't pick and choose, because then that's just basically giving someone an excuse for doing something they shouldn't. Yeah. <laughs> so there were some there were some things that came up for me, definitely. So in terms of the communicating without words, I know I'm jumping around a little bit here, I did sort of bounce about throughout the day. I thought it was really interesting when they said, What are your clients telling you when they don't turn up? Like what does their attendance pattern tell you? non-verbally, i.e. if they're always a little bit late or if they always miss the session directly after you've taken holiday or if they're always really in a rush to leave or vice versa if they're really reluctant to leave um, or if they come to three sessions but always miss the, miss the fourth. Sort of what story is going on and again we've I've discussed this in previous training but not to the depth that it was pointed out to me in this training, i.e. how strong a message can be being conveyed in a person having a pattern of behaviour. And I was like, ooh, ooh, that, that requires a little bit of a little bit of thought, i.e. pairing up the behaviours with the clients that I'm currently working with or have worked with in the past and thinking Oh yeah, <laughs> that was going on. So it's given me another dimension to be able to put into my clinical work, which I really like. And then equally, what comes up for you? So do you feel like you're being forgotten about or mistreated or undervalued or that you feel very special because they want to stay longer? Or, you know, so it's, it was really around exploring like what happens when when things like that go on. And then we looked at, lastly really, in following on from the um, institutional abuse, we looked at how small the percentage is of people that, um, that go on to abuse if they have been abused, and the fact that if they do, again with the reenactment thing, it's normally their way of processing unconsciously what happened to them, making sense of it, and working it through in their own way, which I found really fascinating. Um, obviously not necessarily in agreement with, but found it as a theory extremely interesting as to kind of like have reasons why people do things that the majority of us really think is inexcusable. In their heads there is an excuse or there's certainly a reason 
and, and, in, and to them it makes sense. That is the full set of notes that I took from my session, so we covered loads. One personal awkward situation was um, our process group at the end of the day. <clears throat> we split in half. Half of my class goes into one room, half of my class goes into another. And then the year above us split in half and merge in with us so we get a real kind of cross-section of experience in the process group. And uh, Numpty here walked into the wrong room and sat in the wrong process group and didn't realise until sort of a good 10 to 15, no, 15, 20 minutes into it when the tutor finally decided to say that he thought there was one extra person in the room which he would have known full well right at the very beginning so yet again more gains and sort of like people deliberately making things feel uncomfortable because obviously if he'd have said in the first 30 seconds I could have just run around gone in the other room merged in all have been fine but by leaving it 20 minutes like the group is then formed the group is having a full discussion he then brings that into the room and then of course everyone's got a feeling about it and kind of like doesn't know what to do and it's just like this it's blown up to this way bigger thing and of course i still had the saga of having to go back into the other group and saying ah, i forgot the wrong room really sorry i've not only disrupted that class i've now disrupted this group oh my god it was absolutely it was mortifying, but in the name of mastering my anxiety, I just, I just thought, shit happens, and got on with it. So, overall, great day, learnt loads, feel really positive. Um, I did, I did on the day, because it is about two and a half weeks since I went to that lesson, I did on the day feel very like, It was a lot to take in, but um, but no, now that I'm looking back on it and thinking, what do we do, what do we cover, reading my notes, it was really interesting. So I think, I think a lot of this needs time, like you need to digest it, it's very heavy stuff. And, and I'm learning that I cannot process a, a psychoanalysis session the same night and certainly can't process a lecture the same day. It does need time to sort of sink in. Okay, my next lesson is going to be all about narcissism. Uh, that sounds happy. And um, I will be doing a prep video before I go just to kind of give you a heads up on the notes I read. And I'll be doing a video after I've been, like I've done today, to tell you about the content we covered. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up. If you have experience of agit training or psychoanalysis training, um, or you've got questions on the topics that I've covered today in this video, leave me a comment, ask me a question. And if you want to follow the next stage of the process, then hit the subscribe button where you can follow more of my videos as I upload them. Cheers, guys! Mm -hmm.